Yeah, so thanks. Thanks, everyone. Sorry if you had a problem joining us there. Um, I'm not quite sure why that happened because I, I thought I did everything correctly, but um, I'll, um, yeah, just uh, introduce Kieran, who's, uh, who's uh, our speaker for this evening. So um, Kieran has got some local connections with us up here in the Northeast. Um, you're native of Cumbria, just the next door county, but you went to university in, in Newcastle, so that's nice to hear. And Kieran's also um, sort of heavily involved in biological recording. So, um, but earthworms are your sort of passion, your thing that you're really interested in. And I know I heard you speak once before, and it, it prompted me to join the Earthworm so Society. So, uh, I'm stand by to be impressed. I think so. <laughs> mm. I think that's everything I'll say just now. I'll just maybe at the end, uh, I'll um, say a wee bit. We've got a couple more talks coming up as well, which you've probably spotted. But I'll hand over to Kieran and let's get started. And as I say, apologies if you had problems joining. So, oh, let's put any questions. Did Paul say that? Any questions for Kieran? Pop them in the chat or we'll have an opportunity at the end for you to um, um, sort of if you want so okay o over to you Kieran I'll, I'll mute myself and uh, hand over to you okay well thank you for inviting me Fiona I did, I haven't worn Fiona but there's even a, fo a photograph for, of Fiona's in the presentation which we'll get to later so welcome to Earthworm Biology and Ecology um this is just going to be a bit of a, a whistle stop to about earthworms we're not really going to cover earthworm identification in this talk, so just a heads up, because earthworm ID really requires preserved specimens and a microscope. Um, but we will do a little bit about categorizing earthworms to different um, diff into different types. So, as Fiona said, my name is Kieran. I work for the Field Studies Council in my day job, where I manage a project that's all about encouraging people to learn how to identify and record difficult groups of invertebrates, which also includes earthworms. But um, I also am the national recorder for earthworms. So I run the National Earthworm Recording Scheme. I support biological recorders. I train them people in ID and I collate all of the data and make it all publicly available as well. So that's a little bit about me. Um, now let's talk about earthworms because that's, you didn't come here to hear about me. You came here to hear about earthworms. So, the easiest thing to do when starting off is to look at the word in, in my eyes. And if we break up the word earthworm into the, the two words that make it up, earth can mean a number of things. In this case, we're talking about the substance of the land surface, the soil, and worm can mean a number of things. Um, in this case, we're talking about definition one there, which is any number of creeping or burrowing invertebrate animals with long, slender, soft bodies and no limbs. Uh, we will not be talking about weak or despicable people today, I'm afraid. Uh, so if we put that together, the actual dictionary definition of an earthworm is a burrowing annelid worm that lives in the soil and it's important for aerating and draining the soil and in burying organic matter. So I'm going to do a brief bit of taxonomy now. This word annelid, what does that mean? Well, annelida is a, is a phylum. So if we look at the, the taxonomy, annelida is a phylum and it's the phylum of segmented worms. So any kind of worm that is made up of lots of rings, lots of segments, uh, is going to be an annelid worm. And within that, you've got two main broad categories uh, under class. Sorry, bear with me, my camera. Um, the first is the polychaeta. These are the bristle worms. Now, some of these look like really alien things and um, they're quite wonderful creatures you get a lot of them the marine animals they're called polychaeta poly meaning many and keta meaning bristles because they've got these fleshy protrusions with lots of little bristles coming off uh, some of the more well-known examples of this would be the bobbit worm which they like featuring on weird nature programs and also probably more familiar to most of us would be things like ragworms and lugworms. So the marine worms that you, where you can see their burrows um, in the intertidal period, uh, part of the shore. 
But we're not going to talk about them today, and mainly marine. And then you've got the clitellata. Now, the, the group clitellata are, are called clitellata because they've got what we call a clitellum. It's a saddle, a fleshy, a fleshy part, uh, a glandular part, which we'll come to a little bit later. And within there, there's two groups, the hirudinea, which is the leeches, uh, and leech-like organisms. So we're looking at, um, not, shy, not, not too far shy of um, 900 species there. Uh, different from earthworms and their relatives in that they have these suckers on each end, which they use to either eat prey or uh, feed off prey as a parasite. So they're either predators or parasites. And then we've got the oligarchates. So this is quite a big and quite a diverse group. Uh, everything that's just come up there are the relatives of earthworms. So it includes things like the Enchytraida, which is the potworms. They're mostly terrestrial, also freshwater marine. You even get them living in glaciers. So you get these ice worms that inhabit glaciers. They're the tiny little white worms that you might see in your compost bin or in plant pots in the soil. Most of those other groups are um, freshwater or, and some marine groups. So they look a little bit like earthworms, but they, they inhabit different, a different kind of habitat. The most similar to earthworms there really are the monilegastrida, which are terrestrial and earthworm-like organisms. But what we're talking about today are the Crassiclitellata, which is the true earthworms. Uh, we can see there we've got over 5,000 species and we've got th but of around 20 families with three families found in the British Isles. So that's what Earthworms is. Now I'm going to put you guys all on the spot and I'm going to launch a poll. And I'd like you to tell me if the earthworm you can see on the screen there is an adult true, is it an adult true or false? It's anonymous, so nobody can see who's got it right and who's got it wrong. All right, I'll just give you a couple more seconds. So if you haven't got your voting, get it in quickly. There we go. Right, okay, let's have a look. So 73% of you think that it is, and 27% think that it isn't. Well, actually... It is, so 73% of you were right. And that's because it's got this feature here. So this here is the clitellum that I was talking about that, that all leeches, earthworms and their relatives have, uh, have. And it's a feature that they grow as an adult. So if you see the, the fleshy band, the saddle on an earthworm, it means it's an adult. If the earthworm hasn't got that fleshy band, it means it's a juvenile. Uh, don't go by size, go by whether that's present or not. So it's also always nearest the head end, unless you chop the earthworm. <laughs> but yeah, if you've got a full earthworm, it's always nearest the head end. Okay. So a little bit about earthworm, uh, earthworm morphology. Earthworms don't have a lot of visible features on the outside. These are the features that we use in ID. We're really lucky in the UK that we can um, actually identify our earthworms without the need to dissect them. Around the rest of the world, you actually have to open them up and look at their internal organs. So starting at the top, you've got the prostomium or the head, which is like a, it's a fleshy muscular part that it can protrude to bring food into its, into its mouth. Then moving down, we've got a feature called the male pore where it releases sperm from. Moving down, uh, we've got the clitellum or the saddle, and on that is a feature called a tubercular pubertatus, which uh, as earthworm recorders call a TP, and that's used during sex to grip the other earthworm. The TP is usually quite unique to the species, so that's very important for ID. And then you've also got these little dots all the way along. These are the C tier. And the C tier are little bristles that are used in locomotion. And then at the tail end, uh, you've got the anus. So if we're looking at this earthworm, some things we can take away from this is it does have a top and a bottom. So it has a back and an underside. So it's not symmetrical on the top compared to the bottom. They are, they are different. 
Uh, it is symmetrical down the middle, just like we are. So it has a left-hand side and a right-hand side, and anything it has on the left-hand side, it will also have on the right-hand side. So each earthworm will have a pair of male paws, so it'll have one on each side, and a pair of TPs, etc. Okay, but yeah, and it finally, while well, we're talking about symmetry, it does have a head and a tail. So if you chop it in half that way, it, it's going to be different on both ends. So another question for you. This time, I just asked you to drop your answer in the chat. Do you think this male, this earthworm, is male or female? Put your put your answers in the chat. Fiona, you're not allowed to answer because you've been to one of my talks before. So yeah, a couple of seconds. Do you think it's male or female? Oh, brilliant. So Sue and Mark both, both think it's both. Uh, Stephen male, Stephen female. Yeah, well, you've said both, Stephen. Oh, no, it's two different Stephens. Yeah. Well, yeah, the majority of you there are right. Um, it is both male and female. So earthworms are what we call simultaneous hermaphrodites, which means that they, when they mate, they act as both the male and the female at the same time. So not only do they have both male and female uh, reproductive parts, when they mate, they always use both, both sets of reproductive parts. So how does an earthworm, what, what's the life cycle of an earthworm? So earthworms start life as a cocoon. So the cocoon is kind of a, a lemon-shaped little pod that you'll, you'll find these in the soil. You find them in your compost bin. You might even find them in the in leaf litter, and you can kind of see this one in the left. You can kind of see through it a little bit, and you can see there's an earthworm developing there. So the fertilized egg will be inside the cocoon that will develop into a young earthworm, and eventually that will hatch out. Uh, the cocoon is quite tough. It has kind of a leathery feel, and that allows the earthworm the young vulnerable earthworm to, to grow before it has to deal with the outside world. Um, all of these cocoons on the right hand side are from Lumbricus terrestris, our biggest species of earthworm, and they're, they're all the same. So they're all the same species despite the different colours etc. So these earthworm cocoons can be quite variable. Um, they tend to be quite a regular size for a specific species. So for bigger species, you would be able to see these in the soil. They look like little yellow seeds, but if you if you pick them up, they're not hard. They're a little bit squishy. Don't squish them too hard because you don't want to pop the, the cocoon. But yeah, they feel like they've got a liquid inside. So once the earthworms hatch, uh, they'll look like a mini earthworm, basically. Um, and they'll have the correct number of segments for that species, but they just won't have the saddle. Um, they won't have the sexual reproductive or organs. So that's what they look like as a juvenile. Then eventually as they reach uh, maturity and full size, they'll grow, um, the, the saddle will develop and then they're ready to mate. So to mate, earthworms will basically assume the 69 position and they'll line up next to each other. So these are two different types of earthworm here uh, mating. Um, and what will happen is, this is really complicated, I hate explaining this. Um, each, uh, so they're basically stuck to each other here. So what they've done is they've gripped each other with the, that TP feature that's on their saddle. And then they started releasing um, a, a, a slime to form what we call a slime tube. So they've got a slime tube around them, basically, which allows them to exchange um, sperm. So from the male paw, each earthworm will release um, sperm that will travel down. So from the male paw here, say, it will release sperm that will travel down a groove on the outside of the partner earthworm until it gets to a, a feature called the spermatheca where they can store that sperm. So each earthworm will be doing that. 
they'll be releasing sperm, be traveling inside the slime tube, down the side of the earthworm, and then stored in a feature. Then the earthworms will part and go their separate ways. So there's no internal um, fertilization or anything like that that's going on. When each earthworm separates, it's just got a store of the sperm from the other earthworm. What will then happen is the clitellum, this glandular um, swollen part of the earthworm, will release mucus and form a mucus sheath. That mucus sheath will move down the earthworm, and as it does, it will pick up, e pick up the eggs from the earthworm that it belongs to, and then it will pick up the sperm that's being stored from the partner earthworm and it will slide off the end of the earthworm's head and it will pinch at both sides forming the cocoon and then it will harden with the egg and the sperm inside and there, then we get the fertilized egg. So yeah, I know that that can be quite complex and I'm sure there'll be some questions about this later. Feel free to drop them in, in, the, in the chat and I'll try and explain it a little bit better. There is a full description that I've written that's on the Earthworm Society of Britain's website that explains it possibly a bit better than I can do in person. Um, so that is how earthworms mate. Uh, some earthworms do reproduce asexually, so they do it without a partner. And when they do this, they don't fertilize their own egg. They basically are cloning themselves. So it's an unfertilized egg. So it's a copy, copy of themselves. And again, there's a little bit more information about that on the Earthworm Society website. So still with what is an earthworm, if we look inside the earthworm, we can learn a little bit more about these organisms. So at, this is the head end of an earthworm. At the top, you've got a muscular area. And in that muscular area, you've got a pin side, pin head sized brain. You've got the esophagus and the pharynx. So you've got the start of the digestive system. Uh, a few of the features going, we'll come to the crop and the gizzard later. Um, those um, orange circles represent the sperm of theca, where the, where the sperm from a partner uh, firm would be stored post-mating. They've got a relatively simple circulatory system, so they don't have true hearts. They have these thickened blood vessels, these pairs of pseudo-hearts, and most British earthworms have five pairs of those and they have blood vessels running down the earthworm. They've got three of those. And they've also got blood vessels that run around each segment as well. Um, and like us, they have hemoglobin in, the blood, in their blood. So their blood is red, which is very unusable, unusual for invertebrates. So if you cut an earthworm, they will bleed red like us. And then then we get into the intestine, which is most of most of the earth. And we'll, we'll go through the digestive system now. So like us, they do have a mouth, what um, they do need to feed. So that's the entrance to the gut. The food will then work its way through the pharynx, a, a thick muscular section that is used to suck it in and it will go down the esophagus. Earthworms like, a, like birds, they don't have teeth, but they do consume materials that are quite hard to break down and digest. So things like soil and uh, decaying leaves, etc., dead wood. So they need a way of breaking this up. So they have a crop and a gizzard like birds. Uh, and that's a really muscular area that, that they use to grind up the food. They are known to eat some materials to assist with that. So composting earthworms quite often will um, eat eggshells. They will eat small stones and things like that as well, the earthworms that live in the soil. So, yeah. And some earthworms outside of the UK may have as many as 10 gizzards. So, yeah, this can be quite variable um, across different species as well. The majority of the digestive system is the intestine. Earthworms are basically one big, long digestive system. Uh, and that's where most of the absorption takes place from their food. And then what goes in must come out at the end. You've got the anus where um, they will excrete their poo. Uh, so if we chop an earthworm in half and have a look at what they look like cross, uh, in a cross section, uh, on the outside, they've got a, a skin layer, a cuticle, and then they've got two layers of muscles. And this allows them to move in many different ways. So it allows them to move 
uh, to stretch and contract their body in all sorts of different ways. Then in the middle of the earthworm, you've got the body, body cavity. Within there, you've got the intestine running down um, and you've got the three blood vessels that I mentioned that run the length. They've also got a nerve cord and each segment has excretory organs known as nephridia. Now, earthworms will have different sets of these in each segment because they can excrete different things. So we were talking earlier about mucus and slime. They can also excrete um, defensive mucus and things like that. And they excrete all their urine their, through their skin as well. So each segment has, has these excretory or, organs. And again, outside of the UK, these can be quite important for identification. Uh, but luckily, we don't have to chop up earthworms to, to figure that out. And lastly, you've got the C tier. So most British earthworms have four pairs of these. Uh, how far they're spaced apart is a key ID feature. And these C tier, these bristles, uh, they're important for locomotion. Um, and they can actually be contracted and extended in and out of the body. And that's really important for locomotion. So what I've got here is a video of an earthworm moving. And I'm just going to talk through how earthworms move. So essentially, we, we, if you remember, we've got those circulatory and long, longitudinal muscles that they've got in each segment. And they've got the C tier muscles as well that they use to contract and extend the C tier. And what earthworms will do is they'll move in a wave motion. So they'll extend their C tier at the head end so that the C tier dig into the substrate that they're on. And then they'll use their circulatory longitudinal muscles to contract the body of the earthworm so that the earthworm is pulled forward and that will move in a wave motion down the earthworm. They'll then extend their C tier at the tail end and the wave will move uh, the other the wave will move the other way to come to uh, extend the body so that they've got this kind of concertina movement and it's the C tier sticking into the substrate that allows that to allows them to move otherwise it'd be, just be concertinaing on the spot okay so moving on right so i've got another true or false question for everybody here let's relaunch that poll True or false, earthworms will drown in waterlogged soils due to flooding. So remember, these are anonymous polls. We get asked this question a lot every year when we get heavy, the, the heavy rains in spring. Okay, I'll just give you a couple more seconds. All right, brilliant. Okay, let's share the results. So you're a little bit more divided on this one. We've got 56% going for true, 44% going for false. Well, everyone loves an underdog. The people who said false are correct. Earthworms will not drown in waterlogged soils due to flooding. And the reason for that is if we go back to uh, considering that earthworms are part of Annelida, most of their relatives live in freshwater or marine environments. So. Annelids as a, as a phylum, as a group of organisms, are really well adapted to living in aquatic marine environments. They breathe through their skin. They actually can't deal well with being dried out. If, if an earthworm dries out, then it can't breathe. So, so and many of our, some of our rarest earthworm species are wet soil specialists, and I'm probably one of our most common are wet soil specialists. So they thrive in really, really wet soils. So when we get lots of flooding in an area, um, the, the water that's in the soil won't cause the earthworms to drown. However, if an area is being flooded that has really bad drainage and the water is not draining at all, because the earthworms and other organisms will, will be breathing in that water and using up the oxygen, if it becomes anaerobic, then it can actually kill the earthworms, but it wouldn't be drowning, they'd be suffocating. So a little bit of a trick question. Will earthworms drown in water log cells? No, but if there is a problem with the oxygen being used up because the drainage is, is really poor, then they could suffocate. Now, if that does happen, 
it tends not to have a lasting effect on the earthworm populations because earthworms are able to bounce back quite well. Quite often, there'll be the, there's always the cocoons in the in the soil, so the next generation is all, all, always on its way. And when the earthworms are in their cocoon stage, they can actually stay in that stage for longer than they normally would to wait it out. So cocoons will quite often not hatch unless the environmental conditions are suitable. So they can wait it out in the cocoon stage. Okay. Um, another, so talked a little bit about the biology of earthworms. So what powers do they have? What, what makes, what, what's one of the things that makes earthworms cool? Well, earthworms do have um, amazing powers of regeneration. Um, I thought there was a question here about it. Obviously, I've not asked it. I was going to ask true or false. In fact, no, I can. I can still ask it. So true or false, if you cut an earthworm in half, you'll get two living earthworms. Place your bets. True or false. If you cut an earthworm in half, you'll get two living earthworms. Give you a couple more seconds. Speak now or ever hold your peace. Right. Okay. So again, we've got 71% on false, 29% on true. Um, I'd say it's generally false. If you cut an earthworm in half, you're highly unlikely to get uh, to um, to living earthworms. As we mentioned earlier, a lot of the organs, the important organs for an earthworm are in the head end. So if you not, normally, if you cut an earthworm between its head and its saddle, there's going to be vital organs in both halves. So it's unlikely that the, that the earthworm will survive at all. However, if you do cut the earthworm after its saddle, there is a chance that it might survive. So earthworms do have really good regenerative uh, properties and, and they can grow back um, lost segments they always grow back exactly what they've lost and the way that that grows back is it, it grows back as a thin un, um, unpigmented tail as you can see uh, and then it gets the pigment and it, eventually it will it will grow fatter so all the segments grow grow back and they start off thin and then they get they get fat and it it could take months for that to occur so Another thing to be aware of is different species have different abilities to do this. Some species are really, really not very good at it. Others are much better. In laboratories, some earthworms have been shown to be able to grow back from even a single or a few segments. So they do have amazing powers, but in the wild, um, in natural environments, it's, it's unlikely that an earthworm um, that is chopped between the tail and the head would grow segments back. Right. So they also, so we said we've heard that they can grow back their tail. Some earthworms will also drop it by choice. So um, there's a, a behavior called ototomy, which is a casting off of a part of the body, for example, the tail by an animal under threat. And we can see in this um, picture here of this earthworm that it's tail has started falling off. And what will happen there is the tail will keep wiggling. And the hope is that the predator or whatever is startled the earthworm will go after it. Again, I, I can't really answer what proportion of species can do this. It might be quite variable, but it has been uh, witnessed by a number of different species. Uh, earthworms, like I've said earlier, they, they like it quite damp. So what do earthworms do when it gets too dry or, or when the ground's frozen and they, and they can't do what they need to do? So earthworms will um, go into a state of torpor. So torpor in winter, we call this hibernation. In summer, we call it estivation. It's, it's the same process, essentially. The environmental conditions are not ideal. So what earthworms will do is they'll usually burrow down deeper and then they'll knock themselves in a ball. Well, they'll release all of the, um, they'll excrete everything that's in their, in their gut. Uh, so they'll empty their gut and then they'll knock themselves in a ball and release a load of mucus to protect them. And they'll, their physiology will slow right down so that their metabolism is really, really low. 
and they'll go into a state of torpor. And again, different species will do this to different extents. And sometimes they'll go into a very light state of torpor where they'll wake up fairly easily, fairly quickly. And sometimes they'll go into a really deep state of torpor where uh, it te takes them quite a while to wake up. So that, I think that's earthworm biology. What about their ecology? How much do people like? What what do what do people think of them? So for quite a long time, people have recognised that earthworms were important. So a lot of people think that I've got quite a hard job motivating people about earthworms, but actually most people recognise they're important. And relatively few people fear them, unlike a lot of other misunderstood invertebrate groups. So as far back as Aristotle, he's, he's rumoured to have said that earthworms are the intestines of the earth. Um, I struggle to find this actual quote, so I'm not sure if this is an old wives' tale or whether Aristotle really did say that, but I'm claiming it for now. Um, Charles Darwin in 1881 was really the father of earthworm ecology, and he wrote a whole book on earthworms. Uh, it's his best-selling book during his lifetime, The Formation of Vegetable Mould Through the Action of Worms. And it's, it's a great book um, and still well worth a read today. You can get it quite cheap because it's out of copyright. So anyone and everyone has, uh, is able to print it so you can get it online relatively cheap it just doesn't have the diagrams in that would be in a more expensive original um original print of it and yeah he said worms have played a more important part in the history of the world than most persons would at first suppose what a lot of people don't realize about darwin is that earthworms were actually his life work he conducted um earthworm research for over 30 years um and just skip past that other one um right okay so i've got a question for the chat now um, how many species of earthworm do we have in the British Isles? Uh, feel free to have a wild guess. Let's see what we've got coming in. What I will say is if you know it, don't put it in there. <laughs> Let's let people have a little guess first. Come on. Right, so we've got 5,000, 20, 500. This is quite a range. Well, Jackie, with your 5,000 guess, I saw five, the 5,000 was worldwide. So we've got 5,000 described worldwide. So there's a bit of a clue. We've got 52, 35, 20, 200. Somebody's very close. Right, it looks like the prize is going to go to Acid John uh, with 35. We've got 31. So for an invertebrate group, it's actually a relatively small amount. Um, and actually for, an, for earthworms, we've got a relatively small amount. If you pop over to France, they've got over 100. So what's, there's probably a couple of reasons for that. First of all, British earthworms are very good at what they do, or the earthworms that you get in Britain are very good at what they do. So it, it would be quite difficult for other non-native species to come in and compete with them and secondly just a lot of a lot of the things that they've got on the continent just haven't made it over here since the last ice age so that that ice age and with the english channel forming as well means that there's a bit of a barrier um globally earthworms are still a frontier science so this image here shows you the green are the areas that have got species lists essentially or, or well well studied species lists. I would question some of them though. Brazil is definitely not, for example, fully checklist, uh, it, is, it is not got a full species list. I know for a fact that we've got stuff in the Amazon uh, with these giant earthworm casts that we've never, we've never found the earthworms that make them. So, but in Britain, we do have a very good idea. However, if you look at Africa, the Middle East, we still know very, very little. If you go earthworm sampling in some of these countries, you're 90% guaranteed to find something that's new to science. So um, there's still so much work to do there. And although we've got 5,000 described species, some people estimate up to 50,000 species might exist across the world. Uh, one of the reasons for this is not only are earthworms understudied by people, 
because all the money's in birds and bees and the fancy fluffy things. But earthworms are quite hard to find. So they're quite hard to identify and they're quite hard to find because you actually have to go out with a um, spade and you have to dig up the earth. So there's permissions that you need to do that. It's quite difficult. And if earthworms are quite deep down, they can get away before you can before you can get to them. So, yeah. OK, so a little bit about the recording scheme and then we'll go on. A, we'll talk about the ecology a little bit more. In 2009, a paper, a scientific paper was released. It, it was pre earthworm society. And it was all about how many earthworm records do we have? So um, this is the map of all species of earthworm in the UK. So as we can see here, in the northeast, you're very barren for earthworms, according to the data, as is my home county of Cumbria. Northern Ireland and Wales practically don't have earthworms, according to the data that we held. Uh, most of the data in, in this research paper came from other research papers. So they did a call out to record centres and they didn't get anything back from any record centres. Uh, and I think one of the one of the reasons for that is nobody was formally coordinating biological recording of earthworms. So even if record centres were getting earthworm records, they had no way of verifying the verifying the records and and establishing whether they could be accurate or not. So in two thousand and nine, off the back of this paper, the Earthworm Society of Britain was formed. I joined it, I think, in twenty twelve. In twenty fourteen, I took I launch the National Earthworm Recording Scheme so that we had a formal recording scheme. And by 2020, this is our map of um, earthworm records across the UK and Ireland. Now, it looks like it's loads better and we've got loads more data, but lots of those data points are represented by a single species. And there's still there's still so much to do. And there's still areas, the southwest of England, the northeast, uh, Wales, Northern Ireland, Scotland, where there's huge gaps. Uh, a lot of that data is actually from some environment agency data that I got on a, on a single species. So that's why bits of England seem really well recorded there. But the point I want to make is that launching a national recording scheme actually helped us gather, gather more data. So we're, our understanding of earthworm distributions is getting better. Um, so the Earthworm Society of Britain runs that national recording scheme and we make all of the data publicly available through the MBN Atlas and um, internationally to the through GBIF, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. So I looked the other day and 18 scientific papers have, have cited our data, um, which is fantastic. And only a couple of them are about earthworms. So our data has been used in ways that we never think to use it. So with it being open, it just means that it, it's able to be used by scientists across the world in ways we'd never imagined. We do also share all our data locally, so we send it every so often, all of the data, to um, the record centres through the Association of Local Environmental Record Centres. So any record centres that are a member of them will get that data as well. Although they can also download it from the MBN Atlas because it's all available with um, open data licences. So what does this mean about what we understand about earthworms? Well, this figure here is from a report that Natural England brought out in 2014. So be just before we started the National Earthworm Recording Scheme. And this shows you the species of earthworms in the UK um, and Ireland. Yeah, because, um, yeah, that 31 species is UK and Ireland. Two species have been found in Ireland, but not in the wider UK. Uh, in the wider British Isles. So this is all the species ordered by the percentage um, from, from the records that they had for each species. So what this is telling us is that over a third of all earthworms belong to Allelobophora chlorotica, which is a small green worm uh, that likes, it likes quite disturbed soils as well. Um, what I can tell you, for, and it's it, and some of our species down the bottom end are extremely rare. There's no records, so are they even here? And some of the rare ones, a little bit up there in the naught point something percent, 
they're very, very rare. And this paper gave a rarity category to all of the species, and it announced that things like Octillasian cyanium are very rare. Um, and Icinella tetraedra is very rare. And if I go back to that map, most of the dots on that map now are Icinella tetraedra. But apparently, according to this paper, it was rare. So what I can tell you about this data set that Natural England used was it was all research data. And most people, most researchers will, um, their research is on agricultural um, data or uh, woodland data. So when I've mapped that data alongside ours, what we see is that actually the information that we had a few years ago without the recording scheme data, it was wrong. It, cha it changes a lot. And a couple of things we can point out from here. Some of the things that that natural England report stated were rare are clearly not. The shape of the curve is much less steep. So there's much more variation in species in, in abundance than than the original data set um, showed. And, and even some of the most common ones, even though Allelobophora chlorotica is very common, it's not nowhere near as common as that was making out because it, it likes disturbed soil. So if you're if you're looking at agricultural fields, you're gonna you're gonna find it in in quite in, well in spades, pardon the pun. Right, I'm going to whiz through some earth uh, ecology now, and then we'll open the floor for some questions. So, um, earthworms can broadly be divided into three major ecological groups. I'm going to tell you all this, and then I'm going to tell you something that kind of says that it's that that's not the whole truth. But um, for the purpose of this, we'll go through those three ecological groups. So we're not going to space species; we're going to uh, broad ecological group and that's by where they live in the soil profile essentially so you've got earthworms that are on the surface which are the epigeic earthworms uh, you've got earthworms that are shallow burrowing and soil feeding which are the endogeic earthworms and they live in horizontal burrows semi-permanent within the top layers of the soil and then you've got the anesic earthworms which are these ones here which live in vertical burrows which go down quite deep oh and they all look a little bit different. So color and size is no good for identifying earthworms to species, but it can tell us about the ecological group, the ecological category that they belong to. So the anesic earthworms, if we start right at the bottom, they're deep burrowing earthworms, they live in, live in deep vertical burrows, um, and they surface at night to feed and mate. So they will come out at night and they quite often are able to flatten their tail into uh, into like a spade-like shape and they use that to anchor in their burrow while they're out so if a predator or something like that comes along something comes and alarms them they can quickly retreat down into their burrow they feed on soil and leaves so they feed on leaves and uh, on the surface but they also feed on the deep nutrient poor soil so if you think about what's going on inside the gut of that earthworm they're feeding on nutrient rich leaves they're feeding on nutrient poor soil that's been mixed with bacteria in their gut and they're pooing out their earthworm casts, which I'm coming back to that, don't worry, which look like this, which are really, really nutrient rich. So they're taking soil from deep down in the earth, mixing it up with loads of great stuff. And you've got these nutrient rich um, casts on the surface. So they're, they're great for recycling soil and soil processes. Um, they're always quite large in size, so they can be up to 40 centimetres, our biggest species, and they tend to have a really deep, dark red, purpley, or even black head, and they'll get paler towards the tail. Um, so how deep do anesic, these deep burrowing earthworms, uh, de uh, how deep do they burrow? I, this study from 1953 looked at three... Uh, anesic species, so Aparectidae longa, Aparectidae nocturna, and Lumbricus terrestris, and it found um, I found that they that they vary where they're found in the soil profile. Um, most anesic species you'll get really around burrowing down to around forty five centimeters, which which isn't really that deep. But Lumbricus terrestris, the bigger one. That will go down much deeper and you'll find it as deep down as two meters so it's a really really deep burrowing earthworm um 
And Lumicus terrestris, you can quote from fine with field signs. So, because uh, it will build what we call earthworm middens. So these are lumps of soil, stones, twigs that it uses to cover up the mouth of its burrow. And they really don't like it if you remove this. This is, Darwin did a lot of this experiment and he would remove these. Uh, middens and they build them back the next day. So we've got a picture here from Fiona. So this is a northeast lumbric um, anesic earthworm burrow here. Um, and we can see another one here from the side. And when you find them in the field, they'll, sorry, pardon me, <coughs> they'll quite often be around the same distance from each other, which will be about the right distance from mating so that they can come out and mate would still have their tail anchored in their burrow. <coughs> so the next group of earthworms is the endogeics. Now these are shallow burrowing earthworms. So these live almost exclusively in the soil. They'll sometimes come out when it rains to move. <coughs> they can be pretty much any size. You get relatively small ones, you get relatively big ones. So the size doesn't help us with categorizing these, but they have no pigment. So they can be, they're usually really pale colors. So they can be green. They can be like a really light, like really light pink. They can be blue, yellow, gray, all sorts of sickly looking colors, basically. Uh, what you won't find are deep red, brown, purpley colors. <coughs> they feed, like I said, exclusively on soil and rarely come to the surface. So same study, looking at them, uh, you'll quite often find they're in the top layers of the soil. But again, it will vary through the year, according to the environmental conditions, and it varied by species. It wasn't always the same species that, that were found. And what we can see here is in September, the author of this paper is saying that the earthworms went, must have gone deeper down. So it might be that September was not good environmental conditions, so they burrowed down and hibernated because uh, they, they weren't found anywhere there. Okay, <coughs> moving on, above, above the surface, we've got the epigeics. So these are the surface dwelling earthworms, the leaf litter dwelling earthworms. You find them in leaf litter, dung, deadwood, uh, rarely found in the soil, although I, I would argue that fact, because you do sometimes find them. And they feed on decaying plant matter, such as leaf litter, rotting logs. They look, in terms of the look of them, they look quite similar to the anesic ones in that they've got this dark, they're normally quite a deep red purple colour. Um, the differentiation between the pigment and the head and the tail is not quite as sharp as it normally is on anesics, but the, th the way of telling them apart really is the, the size, they're much smaller. And um, yeah, you'll find them in deadwood. And there's a subset of them, which we call the composting earthworms. And they tend to be a medium size, but they differ in that they look a bit stripy. And um, so they have this yellow and red banding appearance to them, uh, but they are really a subset of the epigeic earthworms. You'll find these, you rarely ever find these in the soil, but you will find them in really rotten deadwood or dung, uh, and most commonly in composting bins. And for some reason, and when we did a, a survey of people with their compost bins, 89% of people that were surveyed, when we asked them, how did the worms colonize your compost bin, said that they managed to, they managed to um, colonize on their own, so they hadn't put them there, which we found absolutely mm -hmm. fascinating. So I think on that point, uh, I was going to give you a little ID quiz, but... Um, yeah, I'll tell you what, we'll go quickly. What type of earthworm do we think this is? So don't worry if you can't remember the scientific name. We've got the anesics are deep burrowing, the epigeic is a surface dwelling, the endogeic is the, um, the shallow burrowing. Anybody want to hazard a guess? Deep, no, deep, it would have a really dark red head. Uh, it's hard to tell scale here, but that's a mite there. Endogeic, yeah, Irene, perfect. Endogeic, it's really pale, so we can tell this is endogeic. Uh, next one is, so this is a really small earthworm. It's got deep red head. Anybody want to hazard a guess for this one?
Yeah, this is an epigeic, yeah. It's a surface dwelling one, so yeah. Okay, right, let me just check. No, I'm not gonna go through that. Uh, yeah, so a little bit of shameless plugging now. My project with the Field Studies Council runs a lot of training courses. Now, we're, um, we're funded to do work in the Southeast and the West Midlands. So we don't do any actual training courses in the Northeast, but we do have an online training course called Discovering Earthworms, which is a four week course. The next one is starting next November. Uh, and for this next year only, it's available for £20. The year after that, when, when we're not subsidising it through the project, the FSC will most likely put it up to £60 or more. So next year really is your chance to, um, to book on it. And what I'll do is I'll put a link in the chat. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'll put a link in the chat for that course now in case anybody's interested. And then I'll take any questions if we've got time, Fiona. Sorry, I went on a bit longer than you asked. Uh, I mean, that's okay as far as I'm concerned. That if you're okay and, and other people and other people are okay, um, I'm fine to to do a few questions. Um, I'll just check with Paul. Maybe I think there might have been a couple of questions came up in the chat. Um, so. Um. So I can see we had. One question in the chat, um, and it was from Acid John. It was about um, predation by flatworms. Is it true or is it tabloid hysteria? Well, so the line on this from government is so they did a they did a big survey across Scotland. Sorry, uh, online earthworm course going in the chat now. Uh, the line from the Scottish government was that um, when they did their survey, they were finding that the flatworms didn't have as significant an impact on the earthworms uh, as was as was thought. That's what I've read. They asked that the so the New Zealand flatworm, which predates earthworms, is still classed as a non-native invasive species. Uh, from what I gather, it is spreading. Uh, and I, I'd be very surprised if you don't have it in the Northeast. They have it in Cumbria and Scotland. However, anecdotally, I've been told by some recorders in Scotland that they just don't get the big earthworms. They, they, they never find them anymore and they find flatworms under stones instead. So the reason it's such a risk to our earthworms is it's the only predator. There's no natural predator that can follow an earthworm down its burrow. So that its only means of defence, those big earthworms, is to retreat into their burrow. And these, um, these flatworms can follow them down there. And what they do is they kind of envelope them and release an enzyme that digests them. So it's like having a killer duvet come and attack you. Uh, it's a bit of a, a gruesome demise. So I think it probably needs looking at more. Um, I would encourage anybody who sees New Zealand flatworms to take a picture and submit that data to Eric um, and, and to make sure that those records are in the system so that we we can monitor, monitor those. I'm guessing, Fiona, you're happy to receive records of New Zealand flatworm. Oh, yeah, all right. Well, maybe not happy, yeah. maybe do <laughs> them. But yeah, yeah, all <laughs> records are uh, are important and good. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, send them, send yeah. them through. So, um, there are a couple of sites where the they seem to be sort of quite prominent. There seems to be quite a population of New Zealand flat, flatworms. Um, yeah. so a couple of parks in Northumberland and the likes. Um, so they are definitely in the area. Yeah, there was a citizen science survey across the whole of the UK looking at them, um, Opal. It's worth it's worth having a look to see what they advise because they, they're asking people to send pictures in as well. What I don't know is what the line is on if you catch one because they're a non-native invasive species, so I don't think you're allowed to release them back into the wild if you've caught them. Um, you would need a licence to do that. So, yeah, just, just worth noting that you might need to look up advice. I'd, I'd advise looking on DEFRA's website um, about what to do if you have got them. And um, you shouldn't pick them up with bare hands as well because it can release some quite nasty chemicals. Um, so if you're gonna, if you, 
are picking them up for whatever reason. Just make sure you've got gloves on. We did have someone once bring one into the museum. <laughs> <laughs> Said, what's this? <laughs> yeah, not great. Uh, are, there, are there any more questions? If, if anyone wants to um, put the video on and uh, unmute and, and ask a question, I don't, I don't know if we had any more in the chat, Paul. No, there wasn't any more. While, while people are thinking about that, I'm, I'm just, oh, Sue, Sue looks like she might have a question there. Um, I was just wondering, because uh, when, when I'm tree planting tomorrow with kids, and one of the things we always get them to do is to really look at earthworms and think about earthworms. Am I right in thinking that the children shouldn't handle them because of the, um, they get upset by the compounds on, on your hands and that can damage their sensitive skin? Maybe. I, I'm not entirely sure, to be honest, Sue. What I just have is have a wash bottle so that you can give the earthworms a rinse afterwards. Because uh, I think it's earthworms are a great organism for engaging children with. They love them. They do. They, they absolutely love they them. They really I, do. I don't want to discourage that yeah. at all. So I would just have a have a wash bottle. Yeah. And you can always get the kids to wear gloves if needs be as well. Um, when handling earthworms and any soil, we always advise um, we always advise using gloves anyway. I used to I used to go rogue whenever I um, did earthworm courses or and not wear gloves. And then I actually got an infection in one of my fingers uh, just from the soil. So yeah, it is always worth uh, being careful, but. A wash bottle to wash off the worms and then they should be fine. Right, thank you. Oh, the important thing actually, Sue, the most important thing with handling earthworms is to handle them in the flat of your hand rather than picking them up. Because ah. earthworms, uh, earthworms are not supposed to be picked up. Their, their bodies can't really handling, handle it. And particularly with bigger earthworms, if you pick them up, by one end they can break into many pieces so the best even though there's more contact with the skin it's probably better for the earthworm if it's lying flat plus then you can watch how they move and you can you, you can explain that to the children as well yeah one of the things i've done in the past is to have a paper plate and you can actually hear them um moving which they've always liked oh brilliant yeah 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 I'll tell you what else is good. It's really good for slugs and snails as well. A piece of perspex, because then you can look underneath as well. Yeah. And, and you get the slime trail for slugs as well. Yeah, 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 that's a good one with snails. Thank you. No problem. We've had another question in the chat from Mike. Um, so where are the areas of the map with few records? Is it because there are no worms or no one record them? Oh, it's definitely because there's no one recording them. Uh, we don't think that earthworms are particularly um, struggling in the UK, uh, but we have these massive gaps. And because I'm quite heavily involved in biological recording, I, I go to a lot of conferences and I quite often hear talks about how we should improve the quality of the data that we get. <laughs> Ad hoc data is okay, but there's not much you can do with it. And I, I normally just sit there like grinding my teeth a little bit when I hear that because that's all very well when we're talking about things like butterflies and, and mammals and reptiles, birds, etc. But with earthworms, we have so little data that actually we need that presence absence dot on the map. Um, one of the, like I said previously, one of the problems that we've got is that you kind of need to be trained to ID earthworms. They're, they're not something that's particularly easy to pick up without a little bit of training. Um, you do need to kill them because you have to preserve them and look at them under a microscope. Looking at a live earthworm for the features that you need to see is, it's really, really tricky. I, I can't do it. Um, and you also have to dig for them. So when I go out recording earthworms, I might spend, uh, I in a day, I, I will get, tens of records whereas somebody going out recording birds will get hundreds of records if they spent the whole day walking around recording so it's it's a slow process to build up those records but we could do with more people more spread out so yeah any invertebrate recorders that, that um 
they're happy with a microscope, have their own microscope, happy with preserving specimens. Uh, we'd be really, really happy to have you along on one of our training courses. When the Bilings project finishes at the end of next year, um, I'll be looking to find people that want to run training courses in places that I haven't been to before, and I'd love to come back to the North East. So um, I will speak to uh, the Hancock, Northumberland Natural History Society, Eric, about the possibility of running an earthworm uh, ID course up there. I'd absolutely love to. And it's a great excuse for me to revisit Newcastle as well. So yeah, uh, always Good happy, job. always happy to go back. Brilliant. Um, oh, we've got a couple more questions. Are we still happy to take questions? Yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah. fine to keep going now. Kieran, are you okay for a wee bit? Yeah, that's fine. We've got um, two more here. So we've got is heavy cultivation de detrimental to worms? Does no till method in agriculture help them? So th this is another one that's a bit tricky. I think in general, no till is going to be better for earthworms. The when you're ploughing the soil, that's really bad for those anesthetic earthworms because it, it chops them up. It, destroys their permanent burrows. So their vertical burrows, they build a burrow system that is their permanent home. They'll line the, um, they'll line the burrow with mucus and they create this, this burrow system. So they're not just munching through the soil aimlessly, they have their, they have their home. And when you, when you plow, it's really bad for them. However, what they have found in some studies is that you get more of some of the endogenic earthworms because they quite like that disturbed soil. So what we're doing is upsetting the balance there as well. The soil is naturally ploughed by the earthworms themselves because we've got them operating at all these different levels in the soil and they're mixing the soil. We just can't see it happening, but it, but it is happening. So a no-till method is definitely better. Uh, with no-till method, quite often you do get compaction and that can be damaging for earthworm populations, but then earthworms are also the solution to compaction. So I think it, it depends how, yeah, it depends on exactly what systems you're using and what state the soil was in in the first place. But I personally think a no-till method is always going to be better for the, for the earthworm community in the soil. Thank you very much, Laura. Um, so I've got a last question here from Morag. Um, so is a partially dried out worm absolutely doomed or can it recover if it's put in uh, damp grass? Uh, that's a really good question, Morag. I don't, I don't know. Um, I tend to pop them in ethanol and then I do them. To be <laughs> <laughs> um, but... Uh, what I would, I mean, if it's above ground, it's going to struggle anyway. It might be better off put loosely in a plant pot or something like that. Uh, they do get trapped in the puddles. So I see that Morag has mentioned that she, she rescues them when they're in puddles. I think it's always better to put them under something than if you put them on the grass, it's going to be like minutes before a robin or, or something picks them up. Uh, but yeah, definitely moving them off the pavement. I suppose you could dampen them as well. So if you're finding them in your garden, you can dampen them, put a little bit of water there and put them under stone or a log or something like that. Uh, I think that's one of those things that will be variable. It, it'll depend how far gone they are and how resilient that individual worm or that species is. So basically that's me talking around in circles because I don't know the actual answer, Morag, sorry. It, it sounded very convincing, Kevin, <laughs> <from> you. <laughs> it, it sort of exemplifies biology, doesn't it? It's never, never quite black and white. <laughs> yeah, I, and actually, when if, if anybody does come on the online course, I, did you do the online course, Fiona? No, it was just a, a talk similar no. to this that I was on, yeah. Um, the, we go into a lot more detail about a lot of these things, but but quite a lot of the time I'm saying... I don't think anybody has the answers to these questions. And a lot of the questions that people will ask, I can give an answer based on a specific species where there happens to be a study on, but for most aspects of earthworm ecology, we don't have any kind of comprehensive knowledge across all, across all or even 
a fair number of species. So there's so many knowledge gaps. And that, that's why I, people will often ask why earthworms. And that, that is why I can make a difference with this because there's so little information. I can, like every little bit that we do uh, really improves the understanding that we have. So, I mean, the bird is in, on this call might, uh, might want to lynch me for this, but what I always say to people is if you train up and become an earthworm recorder, you can have a really, really big impact. And your every earthworm record that you submit is going to have way, way, way more impact and value than an individual bird record that you submit because there's so little information there. I mean, you'll be getting grid square, maybe even county firsts all the time. Whenever I do site lists, whenever I go to a site and survey for somebody, I, I'm normally highlighting that it's there's a vice county first here, a vice county first there. And they, these are common species. It's just nobody's done any recording in that county. And they're always site first because usually nobody's done anything at the site before. Yeah. That's uh, yeah, that's uh, it's incredible, isn't it? Such an um, important group, but so understudied. Um, there's just I noticed a couple other questions there. Um, Sarah's asking, do synthetic nitrates damage worms? Well, the thing, worms are part. part well, earthworms are part of the natural, um, the natural system of, of releasing um releasing chemicals back into into the soil so what they will do is they'll help fix nitrogen into a, a form in which it can be taken up by plants etc so in terms of in terms of fertilizers and things like that what i always advise people is it, any chemicals you're putting in your garden are not going to be great for earthworms, whether they're fertilizers, pesticides, etc. What we want is a healthy natural system. So rather than rather than putting fertilizers into a garden ecosystem, why not compost your home waste and and use that first that as your natural fertilizer? Helps save uh, peat bogs. It allows you to deal with your waste on site, etc. So yeah, earthworms will naturally deal with chemicals. Um, and they can actually, they can be good at getting rid of lots of different things, but they may also act as a reservoir. So if you're putting chemicals into the soil and the earthworms are taking them up, and then there'll be a number of earthworms are being eaten by a, a single bird, that can be really damaging up the food web, up the food chain. And similar, does tap water damage them? Is rainwater better? Oh, good question. Again, rainwater is more natural. So I I don't, I think they're probably fine in tap water, but rainwater is obviously better because it doesn't have, it doesn't have um, the chemicals that are added into tap water. Mm. But again, I, I'm, I'm riffing here. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's that. That's uh, that's that's fun. Amazing, just that there's so much still to find out, isn't it? Um, unless there's anything else, I've actually got a list of questions, and it's it's just um, you know, been so fascinating. Um, uh, I think I'll need to check my memberships up to date with the Earthworm Society and uh, get involved. I, I, I'd honestly, I'd recommend the online course. I put, I learned so much writing it because the. I know a lot of the questions that I get, so I wanted answers for the online course ahead of that. The way it works is there's the study material online. There's four weeks. I think there's biology, ecology, diversity, and then finding earthworms. So there's the study content online, which includes some videos, includes some infographics, et cetera, like some of the ones you've seen today. Then there's a live webinar and there's assignments. So just because it's online doesn't mean you're sat at a computer. We send you outside, we send you digging. You do not pass that course unless you've been out digging for earthworms. <laughs> um, and some of the, one of the cocoon images I showed, that was part of an assignment. Somebody had taken that image of an earthworm and submitted it. So I honestly, if people want to know more, I think the best place to start is that online course. And next, next year, it's going to be the last chance to do it at that subsidized price through Biolink. So it's really, really worth, um, it's really, really worth booking on it. And I haven't put a cap on the number, so I'm, going, I'm willing to take hundreds. <laughs> uh, 
And and we had over 100 on the first run, so yeah. Great. Um, yep, so someone's just asked, could you just give us a reminder when that course is? Something for 2022, Sue, saying, when is the course? Yeah, it, it, it starts on the 25th of October in 2022. So I'm giving plenty of warning so that you don't clash with a, a really nice holiday or anything like that. Um, and yeah, it, anybody who is on this call is eligible for the £20 um, the twenty pound subsidised price because you're all recorders, etc. Um, wildlife gardeners, amateur naturalists, students, biological recorders—they're all eligible for the twenty pound thing. All the information that you need about it is is on that link that I sent. So uh, if you scroll down on that web page, there's more about what's included, etc. And there's actually there's an uh, there's a Everything that I've presented today is a snippet from that course as well. So it's just more of the same from today. But I'm going to stop shamelessly plugging now and I'm going to hand back to you, Fiona, to shamelessly plug your stuff. <laughs> well, just first of all, I just want to say an absolutely massive thank you, Kieran. It's just um, it's fascinating and um, just so well presented and, and um, informed. I'll um, pick up those links and I'll send an email round with them all through to the, the people who've been, uh, you know, who are registered. And just uh, apologies once again if you found if it was hard to log on. And as I say, we've got this uh, recorded, so I'll um, the people who maybe didn't manage to to join tonight, so um, I'll chase that up. But um, absolutely brilliant, Kieran. Really, really excellent talk, and I've thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. And as I say, it's left me with a few more questions than I started, which is always a good thing. So um, thank you so much, and thanks for giving giving your time up here to us in Eric Northeast. And I think it looks like there's a few people keen to do something when when you can get up into the northeast again so thanks so thanks everyone for joining and paul thank you for filling in at the start there um when we were trying to get sorted <laughs>